Okay, so well, welcome to the podcast and good to catch up and chat. Um, Jess, why don't you tell us tell us your story in your own words, and then I'll interrupt with other questions. <laughs> oh my gosh! Like from the beginning, as, um, as however mean, you like to tell it. Oh gosh! Uh, so uh, my name is Jess, and I have a condition called dissociative identity disorder. So basically, the condition is categorized by two or more states of self, essentially. Uh, being able to take control of the body. Um, this may reflect in lots of different things. So, you know, differences in um, opinion and mood and like little bits and pieces, I guess, that would um, shift between one identity and another. Um, so I was diagnosed at 19, um, but I've been kind of aware of the people in my head from... I'd say about like maybe about 13, 14 when um, a friend, you know, kind of broke up with me because she basically said that, you know, what I do isn't normal and, you know, I'm too old to play pretend now, but it, it wasn't pretend. I didn't quite understand that other people didn't have people in their head too. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I that's kind of when I became aware and I kind of suppressed it for as long as I could. You know, I just... I was so adamant that I didn't want there to be anything wrong with me. I was really frightened of it, you know, to suddenly realize that I was different than everyone else. Um, so yeah, I tried for years to suppress it. And um, when I went to uni, it was just kind of chaos. So I was like 18 going to uni and really excited. I chose clinical and health psychology. And um, what I found was that for the first time, like my alters, which is what they're called, my alternate identities, they were just taking control and you know, maybe partying all night or going somewhere in the day when I should be in lectures, like they were just living their own individual lives and it became really chaotic. Um, so the uni said, you know, in order to support you, we can recognize that this is going on for you. And um, I had an amazing tutor at the time um, that was, you know, determined to help me. And uh, she said, if you can get a diagnosis base, you can get something on paper the university you know can actually support you with what you need so that's exactly what I did I just went to a, a specialist and I said look I, I don't at this point I don't care what it is I just want answers you know these are my symptoms this is what I'm dealing with and uh, at the end of it he said yeah you have DID and uh, I've been trying to learn to live with it ever since all right awesome um so when you say like you said, obviously, you were aware of the the people living in my head, wasn't was the terms that you used. Is it are they the thoughts of these the of your alters there at the same time as your thoughts, or are they two separate states of consciousness? Well, they they're two they're, they're separate from my own thoughts. So I guess if people had like an inner monologue, I mean, I have my own inner monologue, and I recognise <laughs> that it's mine. The difference is, I think, when you've got DID, is that you've got other monologues that are very alien to you. They, they, they don't feel that they come from you. They feel like you haven't thought of that. You haven't been thinking about that or you haven't, you know, mentioned that. And suddenly you'll have this, you know, different voice and different, you know, thoughts, feelings, emotions, whatever it may be. Yeah. So yeah, that can be, um, especially at first, it was very confusing because I would think, well, surely this voice in my head is either mine or, you know, something is really wrong. So having those conflicting thoughts and I guess everything about me was um, really hard to live with. And I definitely had a lot of identity confusion and identity alteration growing up. That was that was the hardest, was the confusion learning who am I? Yeah. OK, because um, I mean, I, I have type two bipolar disorder and the, the low me. Um, we've called him the other before now um, because he does not think the same way that I do. But that being said, the high me doesn't think the same way that I do either. But he just, I kind of like the way he thinks. I don't like the way the low me thinks. Um, but they are, they're always, they are definitely my voice and mm -hmm. they feel like they are definitely part of me. Uh, and I know that DID like differs significantly in that. Um when you I say guess again, that's it. the dissociation is the detachment. If that makes sense. Well, yeah, that was the bit I wanted to kind of jump into a little bit more because you said obviously when you were in uni that the um, some of your alters were basically living their own life. Again, were you were you were the kind of the prime Jess version of you? 
were they present during those moments and basically as if like you were watching from the sidelines and you had no control or is it literally like you have entire days that go by or time like time frames that go by that you are completely unaware of yeah i mean that that totally happened um in terms of my life i felt like it was just slipping out of my hands you know i you know, I, I just remember i was away for a good few months on end i couldn't you know and um I think at that point, it just felt almost shameful to kind of make myself come back and return and stand with what was going on and, and kind of look back and realize again what's happened. I couldn't take the shame of it. I thought, I don't want to find out. And I ended up kind of sinking into disappearance almost. Like I wasn't around for months and months. And, um, you know, I, to be honest, I can't remember if it was the summer that turned to winter or the winter that turned to summer. But either way, I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is an entirely different season. You know, I've where did this go? What's been done? Um, and I think in a weird way at that point, I realized that I couldn't do that again. I couldn't just let myself sink into like a, a pity. I, I needed to help myself be present and aware and come to terms with what was going on for me yeah okay awesome so you said obviously since the diagnosis it's been a, a process of learning to live with this what sort of what sort of changes and what sort of techniques um have you kind of or realizations have you come to that help you to manage this better Gosh, that's a really good question. Do you know what? When I had my diagnosis, the first thing I thought of was I had like a kind of a mixed emotion. I was sad. I was pleased that I got an answer, but equally I was devastated, you know, lots of mixed emotions. But ultimately I was really excited that now I was finally going to have some help from mm -hmm. someone. Um, but there wasn't any, <laughs> you know, I, I went to the specialist clinic and it was like a seven hour round trip from my uni at the time. And there was no extra help. You know, I, I took it to the NHS and they basically said that they don't have anyone that can help me or anyone that specializes with dissociative, dissociative disorders in um, in the county because I guess funding is different in each county um, for the NHS. And um, basically they didn't know anyone who could help me. So I thought, okay, I'll uh, maybe try private therapy, even though, you know, I was on a student's uh, wage and I was working full time and trying to kind of balance that. But I thought I'm so desperate. I just need help. So, you know, I called around and I distinctly remember one woman that I talked to, she just laughed at me down the phone. Like it was the most unbelievable thing she'd ever heard. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> And um, I guess in a weird way, it yes, it made me angry, but it made me more determined. And I thought, you know what? If no one else is going to help me, I'm going to have to help myself. And I think the biggest thing genuinely that's helped me is psychoeducation. It's learning more about my disorder and how and why it does the things it does. Because by understanding that, it gives me a little bit of control that otherwise I'd lost. Mm. So psychoeducation is definitely the biggest one I'd recommend for anyone, at least coming to terms with a, a disorder like mine, um, you know, and understanding what makes them tick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel the same way. You know, I'm, I'm um, reasonably well educated on bipolar. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I've gone the full hog because going the full hog sometimes is like reading the uh, side effects on medication. <laughs> it's suddenly now, hold on a sec, there's something that I didn't know that I, I might be feeling and now I'm suddenly feeling it. <laughs> like there was a set, there was definitely um almost a, a level of self-diagnosis you know good old dr google at one point but um but yeah I, I massively recommend kind of if you do have a condition getting yourself educated on that condition and what it actually means um and then combining that lived experience with that um that practical experience and that kind of learned experience as well which is That's so important as well dave like you mentioned that like practical yes your own experience you don't necessarily have to fit in every single box for every single bit that you read and i think that's another thing because you start then doubting yourself or doubting your disorder and then thinking you need to be a certain way or but that's not true you know i feel like the dsm you know the diagnostic statistical manual where all these disorders are kind of based off yep. i feel like they're a really rough skeleton basically for what 
could be or what could happen. And yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a diagnosis, you've, you've ticked all the right boxes and yeah, you shouldn't try and pigeon your pigeonhole yourself into a particular symptom. Yeah. 100%. And that's the thing is like, um, we always, we all talk nowadays about mental health being a spectrum, but I think people need to hear more that each condition has its own spectrum within it. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, even bipolar, there's the obvious type one versus type two. I count myself lucky as only having type two um, because it's not as it's not as dangerous and not as intense as type one. doesn't mean it's pleasant, <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's like even within type two, there is. I've, I've met people with type 2 bipolar that their entire experience with it is different than mine. Um, I've met people within type 1 like that, uh, their experience is different from each other as well. And it's it's important to realise that. In fact, the, the phrase I actually use a lot of times instead of saying I have bipolar because if you have a cold, you are symptomatic of a cold. I am not always symptomatic of bipolar. Um, I am, I don't know symptomatic of it maybe 20 percent of the time and at the moment that's more mania than depression but hey probably should touch some wood around about now um but, but um but basically um i say i am prone to the symptoms of bipolar and that means i am more likely to get mania or more likely to get depression but it but in a kind of internal dialogue i don't mm -hmm. have it all the time um so it, like i'm not symptomatic of it all the time is kind of what i suppose i'm aiming for there and that's the thing is like that there, there are there are things within each disorder where it's like he, like like when you look at the side effects on a medication, like I mentioned before, it's that's like you could have got one person that experienced one of those side effects and they have to list it. The same as when they are actually you know diagnosing people and people report their own situations with things. They might have, there might be a condition or a symptom of the condition that comes out in ten percent of people, but it's like but then when the Wikipedia page gets made for it, it's like this is a condition and um the, it's i suppose with with mental health it's definitely not worth kind of, well not sorry it's definitely worth being aware of the fact that some of these things are can be um can be perceived so like especially anxiety is the prime example of this it's like an anecdotal uh, not an anecdotal a a placebo type effect in let's say a gastrointestinal issue where the person feels like the gastrointestinal issue is fixed, but actually scans show that it isn't. Um, that placebo effect is kind of a bit, a bit of a problem in that area because you want the actual thing to be fixed. However, if someone's neurotransmitters don't change, but their perception around their anxiety or the depression does change, that's actually the symptom is being alleviated and therefore in a weird way it doesn't really matter if that's mm -hmm. changed uh, so the same way the, this i suppose psychosomatic idea is you know once a person thinks have i got this then they start then going zoning in and looking for like feelings within their body and going is that there is that kind of thing there and um again i suppose we do need to normalize the idea that not everyone will experience the same thing um and uh, i suppose one thing on that you said at the beginning is that you know it's it's this it's it, yours is defined as you know one or more altered sta altered states of consciousness or, alt or alters right um, and various people with DID will have a varying number of alters is that correct to say yeah so the the minimum it says it says two or more but you know there have been reports in the thousands and mm -hmm. and you know nothing is quite in the medical journals about, you know, the, the highest amount, but, you know, the reported lower, lower amount is, you know, um, just two. So it could be two. I have five yeah. and a couple of bits is what I say, because you can never quite be certain. You can never be quite certain necessarily like how many are there, you know, because it's kind of your your blueprint of your personality that was meant to be is kind of in pieces you know and so you're never quite sure if it's a big chunk or if it's a little sliver somewhere in the distance that you're missing you know yeah. and that's currently what we're you know trying to do really is is just rebuild our blueprint help all those pieces come together and be more consistent be more coherent just and be able to kind of yeah I guess just live like a, an easier life I want to say you know it's um some people choose to live multiply and, you know, kind of let their alters do what they want to do all of the time and live a very, um, 
you know a life like that but I you think you know in recent years for us it's just highlighted that actually we prefer to be closer together and kind of handle one life and it's otherwise it's just too much to juggle especially I think you know now I, I have a husband I have a, a two-year-old and it's it's for us it would just be way too much to uh, <laughs> live completely separately like we used to yeah um I want to touch on the fact that obviously you know, I know obviously your pronouns being they and them but when you self-identify it's always us and we um is that something is that kind of what was the decision there you know like in terms of to was was there a point in which you actually stopped referring to yourself in the I form and started referring to yourself as an us form and was that part of the journey yeah do you know actually I've been thinking about this recently so right at the beginning you know it was always I mm-hmm. um and I think I mean at least from what I remember you know I would always stress that it was I even though I was then aware that there could be a we, I was very much an I. Um, And then kind of around, I guess, the more acceptance of our diagnosis around that point and the acceptance of ourselves being multiple, that's when I started to use we. Like I I felt like, yeah, you know, it's a team, right? Team effort, we're a we. We're not an I, we're a we. Um, And it's quite funny now because now we're coming to what we feel is like the tail end of the journey. We're kind of, we've gone through the slope and we're kind of down here now. And we're trying to use I a lot more because we understand that we're all pieces of a whole puzzle, basically, you know, and we're trying to, yeah, like I said, just, just kind of identify more with each other. So we, we, we are still interchangeable. We still do use we, um, but it's much less so than it used to be even a year back year or so back yeah. um we've had specialist therapy this last year and it really has I mean we've been you know giving ourselves I guess self-help and self-therapy for the last Mind 10 years so day. you know Bobby I Mike kind of feel three that got 100 of the bits this, out we did Thank the bulk you for of having the work Jess on to share her story and, she and her system are so wonderful has um yeah, just really helps kind of untie those knots that we couldn't necessarily do ourselves. ourselves. And so, yeah, we're at a point where we're kind of aiming to, in the future, be one whole again. That's where that's our vision, I guess, in terms of recovery. Um, but not everyone with DID wants to be whole again. And there's something called functional multiplicity where, I guess, kind of where we're at now, where you can live functionally as multiple without having to be one person yeah so you mentioned before that you have five alters is that you plus five or is that five including you five including me yeah okay. so um the host is also an alter or the the core part or whoever, whatever you kind of want to use the term um yeah so i'm also an alter as much as the other alters i often say my alters because it feels that way sometimes but that's not the case kind of like I said we're all parts of an overall puzzle okay and what who are the other alters <laughs> so um we I've read have... a bit of this this is by the way if anyone wants to see um go to Jess's Instagram page for this which is multiplicity and me on Instagram um and you can see visualizations of each of the alters and this was one of the one of the more fascinating things for me what when I, when I went through your page um I didn't I don't think I actually hit like on any of them because they were like all far back and there's that whole you hit like on someone's page far back and it shows you've been stalking but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <It's> flattery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a bit weird about it <laughs> but um, but yeah, anyway, sorry, carry on. No, that's fine. Drum roll. So uh yeah, I have so there's me plus four main others. So you've got um Jamie, who's very British, English, kind of sort of kind of speaks with Channing a Blood bit is of a now a member of the Dave Cave. Um, you know, he's very intelligent, very confident, he's our social light, and he I don't know, I guess he's very relaxed, he's not got a care in the world. Um but he is kind of the carer for the system and um, you know he looks after all of us he's also the only one of us that needs prescription lenses um then we're moving on to ed so ed is known as um, i guess if if alters had roles he'd be known as a persecutor so it's a part that would internalize i guess all the bad um you know and 
I kind of, I think we use the term or we kind of coin the term misguided protector. So if Jamie was a protector of the system, Ed's kind of a misguided, like, you know, he does things because he feels that he has to mm -hmm. in order to not be persecuted any further externally. So it's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the way it works, but he's very artsy. Um, he's the only one of us that's left-handed. He speaks with a Cockney accent. He loves cooking loves his wine um yeah and he's kind of quite a moody but you know we love him for it now we we accept that then we've got jake um who's jamie's brother um and he's got an american accent and he's very much the boy next door kind of vibe um he's really big happy kind of cheerleader guy and he's vegetarian or vegan, plant-based, I think is what he last told me he was. He was saying he's plant-based. I'm not going to necessarily say vegan. Um, and he loves nature. He loves meditating. Very big into well-being. That's very much his bag. Loves animals and, you know, everything to do with that kind of stuff. And then we have Ollie, who's the, the teenager, basically. And he enjoys video games and chilling with friends you know he's uh, very opinionated but uh, yeah, we've had to kind of teach him to to reel it in in recent years um, <laughs> don't let him on twitter <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly um twitter's definitely where he's had a poke around before and um, maybe <laughs> shouldn't have so uh yeah and that's that's the crew and then you've got me and i'm yeah i'm mainly the main the main one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, see, there's there's so many, there's actually so many questions I wanted to ask and sort of you've already kind of hinted at them. Um, Jamie, only one who needs prescription lenses. Mm -hmm. So what, what would be the phrase that you would use when, when like one of the altars is in the driving seat, so to speak? Oh, so if they if they're in the driving seat, that means they're they're out or they're forward. They're forward. Okay. So literally, when um, when Jamie, this this is one of the things that because obviously my whole bag is or you know the mind and mindset and understanding how the mind can totally utterly impact us physically. And um, one of the things that's always fascinated me about DID is things like the two of what you've just said. Really, one is the only one with prescription lenses and mm -hmm. needs a prescription. Um, and Ed is the only one that's left-handed. Mm -hmm. So when, 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 um, basically when, when Jamie is forward, basically, do you need to have glasses or corrective lenses on at that point? Yeah. So not always. Jamie's one of those that he's, he's like a part-time glasses wearer. So he just needs them for, you know, things far away, driving or, you know, computer work, which is really interesting, actually, very, um, interesting for us because I guess, you know, integration kind of means to bring us closer together dissociation is you know the the thing that makes us further apart integration brings us together and the more that we've integrated the more that we're kind of having little I don't know the close I guess the, the the more that some traits are spilling over and a couple of weeks ago I spent a week in agony like working from home I'm, a, I'm all day at a computer screen and I was getting these intense migraines, like really, really bad, like light sensitivity. I took, oh my gosh. And every time I went back on the computer, I was like, I can't, I can't look at the screen. I can't work. What is going on? Um, and then the Monday after, Jamie was just like, I wonder if we just wore the glasses today, if that would help. <laughs> Lo and behold, yes. So <laughs> I even went to my doctor, like something's really wrong with me. I'm having these terrible migraines. It's just bloody eye strain. So, you know, what we're learning now is that um, maybe we need glasses, like I need glasses, yeah. maybe. Um, and I guess the way that that's done, apparently scientifically, is that different altars have different muscle memory. Uh -huh. So what maybe when lockdown kind of lifts, I think what the sensible thing would be is to get our eyes retested to see if there's any changes or any differences or maybe... Uh, I need glasses and Jamie needs glasses or maybe some of us do some of us don't we haven't quite worked that out yet but yes mo primarily for years Jamie's the one that's been the only one that's needed prescription lenses all right cool I'm gonna actually go to a question from the chat that's literally just come in normally I save these to the end but this one's this one's kind of on the top of my mind right now as well because obviously yeah. all of your alters are male yeah um 
Is there any is there any kind of other issues like gender dysphoria? Oh, massively. Yeah. I mean, again, not so prevalent now. Um, but in my teens, it was the worst, the absolute worst thing. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know if I was a boy or a girl. I didn't know if I was straight or if I was gay. I didn't know anything. And it was a really unsettling feeling because I know in my heart of hearts that I wasn't a boy. And yet I felt so much dysphoria about the body I had some of the time. Like I would just cry in the mirror. It would just be dreadful. And, you know, later working out that Jake is the one that holds the most gender dysphoria. So he really, really holds that close to his heart. You know, he would often bind our chest and he would dress in baggy clothes and put our hair up. And yeah, he would kind of live his own life. I'm kind of, you know, I guess, well, in a weird way, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that, you know, Jake even used to be kind of a catfish online um, because he'd have his own profile. He'd have his own, you know, but he wasn't intending to catfish anyone. He just wanted to be himself. He wanted to have a space to interact with people who genuinely just see him for him. So um, that's been really tough. And I think Jake's done a lot of kind of mindfulness and acceptance about the situation. Um, And it didn't really, you know, it was on and off for years. And sometimes he has a bad flare up. I think the last really bad one, to be honest, was um, when I was about six months pregnant (laughs) and I started to show. And um, he disappeared then for like... Oh my gosh. I think another six months after that, he wow. was like, I can't use it. I can't handle it, which is fair enough. And he needs to do whatever he needs to do to feel comfortable. Um, but yeah, gender dysphoria definitely exists. Um, although I'm very thankful, not so much now since Jake's kind of been working on that within himself. Yeah. Amazing. Um, going back to kind of Ollie as well, you said that he's the teenager. Is he always a teenager? Like, does he not age? He did age um, for years and years and years. And then he hit 17. He kind of aged with the body. And then he's hit 17 and he didn't age this year, which he should have been 18. Did he miss? So, he must have um, read that whole don't grow up, it's a trap meme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is. It's totally a trap. Surprised. He loves his memes. Um, yeah. yeah, but he's just, I don't know. I think he's, in a way, he's like that inner child that everyone has. Do you know what I mean? He's that part of us all that we all have that kind of have that want to feel young or be young and you know even though he's kind of 17 sometimes he's really young at heart so you know he's all about the turkey dinosaurs the chicken nuggets the the fish fingers you know and um good lad that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, you know and again like everyone has that even I kind of have my own inner child not DID but you know what I mean the same thing you know where I just want to be cuddled and watch disney films you know same same kind of thing yeah there's a lot of love for you in chat by the way just thought uh, oh, there's a lot of people I, everyone who's in chat i'm not ignoring you i just normally leave it to the end but because you've just been so much love i just want you to all know that i am seeing it out the corner of my eyes um, it's so sweet i didn't load it up because i was thinking of lag i was like what if i load up your channel and then it lags this one so it should it, it, <laughs> it doesn't normally but it can be it can be horrendously distracting <laughs> like um but yeah um i'm just seeing if there's any and apparently some of my alerts were still on on the actual stream but hopefully they're not because i'm recording it on my computer as well so i'm hoping that halfway through thank you bark for mental health for coming in with the raid as well um so if that does happen halfway through the podcast someone's going to hear a big dun, 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 dun. Um, which is a huge sort of Viking horn. I'm just kind of having a little scroll to see if there were any other questions about from the chat. Um, okay, yeah, because while we're still up talking about the, the, uh, the altars and stuff, how frequently does an altar pop up? And would you say if they do, it is controllable or do they pop up with triggers? But interesting. Again, there's kind of lots of answers within that one question. So altars can be triggered out, yes. Um, they can be triggered out in a positive or a negative way. So... I mean, I think, again, I was kind of one of the first on the field to use the term positive triggers in terms of, you know, getting alters around. Um, Because I guess we found that, like, ice cream vans, for example, Ollie would always be like, yeah, bro, like, I'm getting a screwball, you know, first thing. Good choice. Um, (laughs) So that would be, like, a positive trigger. Um, A negative trigger then would obviously be something where 
it sets off a trauma or a memory that invokes another part to come forward. Um, so yeah, so again, just something negative that can bring another part forward. Um, in terms of, is it controllable? I would never use the word controllable to describe DID. I would, however, say it's manageable. So you can manage it, like I think with any mental health disorder, you know, to, to a point, um, but you can never say never. So as much as, you know, like today, for example, um, not, I mean, not that I've heard from anyone today. <laughs> Actually, today's been really quiet. But today, for example, we'd usually talk around the fact that, right, okay, who's going to be doing this? Who's going to be doing that? You know, and it's kind of made an agreement and then that person just gets on with it, you know. So um, like if uh, Jamie wanted to go, I mean, again, pre-lockdown, wanted to go to Cardiff to see some friends, he'd say, okay, on Saturday, I'm going to come out and go see my friends, you know, and we'd all be like, yep, cool, that's your time. Um, but again, some things happen and sometimes it has happened where Jamie's gone to see his friends, but Jamie's not been the one out. So we're kind of just going anyway in hopes <laughs> that when we get there, you know, Jamie will come forward. But again, it's not always guaranteed. So I think as much as it's manageable, it's not always, you know, a promise, if that makes sense. Do your alters all have their own friend groups? They, I think they used to more at uni. That was definitely more of a thing at uni. I think more so now we have our, like every friend is all of our friends, if that yeah. makes sense. Like everyone is, I think everyone's got their preferences or everyone kind of identify with a different friend group. Um, like one of my bestest friends is from childhood and I, you know, but actually the other alters have never made themselves known in front of her, never done it. Oh, wow. So she's my friend and I'm quite protective about that. I think that was more of a past issue than I am now, I think. But I think more so now the alters just kind of will probably feel a bit uncomfortable now about presenting themselves after all these years. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, she's my best friend and I've been very protective about that. Um, so, you know, she she knows me and that's it. But then, um, yeah, I think um, Ed, for example, like his best friend is a girl we know at uni called Joe. And um, they did so much together at uni and they're like, like this, you know. So again, like yesterday, I actually spoke to Joe on Zoom. Like we had a little catch up, but Ed wasn't around. So again, perfect example. But, you know, I'm still happy to chat to her, still happy to update her. And I'll pass that on to Ed when he's about next. Mm. This might be a, a, a too personal question. So if it is, tell me to shut up. Did they, fine, but did they all, did they all, did they, any of them have different romantic interests? Because you said obviously earlier that it did make you question your sexuality quite a bit. Did, did, like, did each of them have different romantic yeah, interests? Yeah, actually, um, yeah. And I think that, again, that's been quite hard because, you know, Gaz and I, my husband and I have been together, I want to say like coming up like 13 years now, I think we've been together. Um, so... Again, I think at uni when we had far less cooperation, far less control, that was probably the worst of it. I know that Jake kissed another girl when, you know, he was, we, he was about 13, 14, you know, again, just a friend. Um, and then again at uni, um, had a night out and yeah, got a little bit too merry with another girl. However, um, his dysphoria anyway kind of stops him there yeah. or stopped him there because he was like I can't like which is good for me thank god <laughs> um, but you know and I think you know he he was in great regret about it it's not something that Gaz doesn't know you know my husband doesn't know we he's very aware that you know um especially at that time in life it was a really difficult thing for us to all like be cohesive I guess just basically get into an agreement um I mean, so it's hard Jamie's enough very, trying. To, it's try, hard enough trying to figure out your sexuality, like, and what it all meant in the world as a teenager, right? anyway. So, combine four of her opinions into that. I can't imagine that was easy. Exactly, and you know, they all do have their own sexualities, which makes it even more complex. Probably why I had such a hard time understanding, you know, what made me me. Um, Jake is a straight male, and that's you know, again, so this relationship has always been really tough for him, and I think you know, maybe deep down, that was his little way of saying, I'm just going to pretend to live my own life. I'm going to pretend to do this for me. Um, which is also why he's never kind of emotionally got attached to anyone because he knows that he would find that very difficult to pull away from. And it would be very complicated, obviously. 
Um, but thankfully, nothing since. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, a couple of nights out at uni, you know, a little bit steamy, but nothing else. And, you know, everything's been kind of agreed upon now. And then it is sad for Jake in a way, you know, it's something that he has to accept, you know, because... I, I understand now that, you know, I'm a straight female, but I also identify kind of as asexual. I guess it's a kind of a new term I'm learning to understand as well. And it's something that I've picked up in the last few months that I think that's probably where I'm at. Um, so, yeah, I think sexuality is a complicated thing. And Ed is Ed is a gay man or yeah. And then Jamie is bisexual and Ollie's asexual. So, again, we've got a mixed bag and I think it's it's taken a long time I think I want to say as well, I think it's important with DID or at least for us in our experience to initially compartmentalize who belongs with what and where. So, again, you can understand things like, OK, whose feeling is that? Whose whose, you know, attraction is that? Yeah. And you can understand where it's coming from. But equally towards the end, if you do want to move towards integration and do want to kind of move closer. Yeah, it's kind of more about undoing those boxes and kind of understanding that again things like gender and sexuality they're all on spectrum yeah so you know yeah <laughs> yeah 100 percent. all right awesome um right i have two more main questions if anyone in the chat does want to ask any questions um please do get them in the box now and um they will get asked in a moment remember to at me so i can see them and find them easily um yeah, I want. There's two more questions I want to ask. One is about the work that you now do, but I want I want to leave that until the second one because I want to get I want to get this question out the way and kind of dealt with first. And um, we talk a lot on this channel about how um, various conditions are displayed within the media, and by media I don't just mean you know the papers. I mean movies and stuff. Obviously, in the last few years, there's been a very, very, very famous film um, called Split. Um, the only time DID has been mentioned in, in our channel before, because I refuse to talk on things that I don't personally understand. And like, so if someone it's wants to, and we, we actually yeah. haven't had someone, we've only had someone who had a friend with DID come in and talk about it, not the person themselves. So we try not to kind of add our, um, mm -hmm. add, add our, un, our non-understanding voices to the, to the mix, unless there's an, un, there's an understanding voice at present. Um, so I've been waiting to ask this question to someone for about six months now. Um, <laughs> Are you familiar with the film? Oh, yeah. Did you watch it? I did. Okay. Um, what sort of impact... Did, okay, first, I mean, and we know it's, a, it's, a, it's not supposed to be accurate anyway, but what sort of impact did that have on the DID community? Oh, We've heard I mean, nothing really, but the bad so far, by the way, so... Yeah, and it, I think it is that, you know, like, quite literally every time, especially Facebook, I think Facebook's the worst, it's absolutely rife, every time that you know, DID gets mentioned somewhere. So um, a friend of mine recently did something with Lad Bible um, talking about her DID. And the comments are just littered with, it wasn't me, it was Patricia. You know, it's kind of this line that forever lives on. And thanks to this film, it's been made into a meme again mm. that can take the piss out of something that's quite sorry i didn't mean to swear oh, take it's, the mickey it's, it's okay it's <laughs> take okay the mickey out of, um, <laughs> this kind of disorder you know out of a, it, it, it is a real disorder but i think yeah it definitely cheapens it and devalues it and i was really frustrated by the film because i love i love a good horror don't get me wrong i love a good psychological film um, you know, there's things like, for example, like, like Sucker Punch is one of my favorite yeah. films. And, but they never mention a specific condition. They never mention a specific disorder. And I think that's fine. I think it's really cool to have a film that can express the psyche or, you know, understand what could be going on for someone. Um, but I think when you slap a label on it, you're in, you're straight away, you're saying, this is how this disorder works. This is how it looks. Um, again, Shutter Island's another one of my favourites, but they never ever mention a disorder on it. You don't mm -hmm. have to, and I think that was such that was the main letdown. I mean, I'd at least kind of forgive them if they'd use the old label of multiple personality disorder, but they didn't. They used the brand new one <laughs> that we. I think we'd kind of helped move away from that, um, and I did. I, I felt like for the community, it took a huge step back for us in terms of, you know, having that believability again you know once again we were a mockery and I gotta be honest I mean I remember watching it with another friend actually who had DID she was staying at mine and um I'm, I'm not gonna lie we uh we we borrowed it from somewhere because we weren't going to give any 
capital to the it's, film. It's okay. We're not going to send um, the feds around for you. <laughs> but, you know, we watched it together. And I remember thinking the first five, not the, well, not the first five minutes when he kidnaps people, but like the bit with the psychologist at some point or the psychiatrist, whoever she is, that actually, you know, the way she was talking and expressing and that was pretty good. And then the rest of the film was terrible. So I think the first <laughs> the five minutes are pretty good. The rest, I think, is just, it's so far away, I think, from reality, I mm. guess. Um, but it's an M. Night yeah. Shyamalan film, so it's supposed to be far away from reality. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's also very true. Uh, I know, and I think, but, but again, like his interviews were, you know, he said, oh, I spoke to people with DID to make this film. Yes, he spoke to people with DID, but then he also rejected everything that they told him. Oh, really? <laughs> that's the bit that he left out, you know. So, um, it's, yeah, I it's think a strange one for me because obviously bipolar gets covered in movies occasionally. And I mean, in TV more, the, the big two that it's been covered in, um, one would be Homeland. Um, mm. And the second one is they're currently covering it in Grey's Anatomy. Now, for me, I oh. sat there watching Homeland just going, this isn't bipolar. Like, <laughs> literally. Um, however, I've spoken to, as I said before, spectrums within the condition, you know, like, so, um, but how they're doing it on Grey's Anatomy at the minute is so accurate to my life with it, apart from the fact I'm not a surgeon. Um, but it's so accurate to kind of like the way it is for me that I get traumatized watching it. Like, I'm, I'm okay again afterwards and everything, yeah. but like, but seriously, it's so close to kind of, to it um but it's it's one of those those things that like i don't know for me watching any sort of film like or tv it's remembering that it's like it's you know well let's first put it this way i'm a scouser we don't get portrayed very well in film and tv very often so i suppose maybe that's <laughs> that must have been what's desensitized me to it over my life and stuff like so that so that i'm like that's not correct in fact actually i used to get really wound up by um Sound. I'm a I'm, I'm a trained sound engineer. That's where my background is. And oh, really? That's yeah. amazing. Um, and it used to really wire me up when you see producers on screen um on, on thing and and basically they're pressing things and doing things and like it's the same as when djs are like they've got just got someone else's song playing and then like they're like and it shows mm -hmm. the hands doing all sorts of things and you're like there was literally no cut or no blend or anything <laughs> in that point of it they're just trying to make it look more interesting than you know you know okay mixed djs one thing or battle djs is one thing but your regular sort of dj is literally doing a mix at the end of a song, but they need to make them look interesting for the whole three and a half minutes. Um, and those things used to really wind me up. It's like, it's funny what kind of, what that, that, those things probably wound me up more than bad representations of bipolar disorder. I've yeah. Got and, and you know, I think it's, it's almost one thing being bad. I think it's another one when, you know, you make somebody with the disorder a murderer. I think, you know, because again, people with mental health, I'm sure, as you know, are much more likely to be victims and perpetrators. Yeah, correct. And I think, regardless whether it was split about DID or a film about bipolar that portrayed the same thing or schizophrenia, whatever it is, I think Hollywood really needs to move away from demonizing mental health in that way. And yeah. um, I think, you know, some of the worst crimes that have ever been committed are by people who are completely sane or so they say, you know, um, who don't have a label to them and just did these acts because they wanted to. And, you know, maybe we can just focus on that. Maybe it's not all about... <laughs> Yeah, you know, having a label. I mean, I'm in, I'm in completely two minds about that because on one side, it's like, right, we need the stigma removed, and we need, we need people to kind of, for it, like, for a fact, accept the fact that actually there's more, there's more dangerous people without mental health issues out there than there are dangerous people with mental health issues. Um, however, at the same time, there are also dangerous people with mental health issues. So it's, and I want, I want what I think of it as always, my big goal is what is a truly normalized and equal conversation around mental health. Mm. Um, and to me, it's like, if you, if you did that for like the next 10 years, there's no one, no one with mental health is allowed to be the villain in a thing. Eventually we'd probably turn around and go, well, that's prejudice. Why can't we be villains? You know, it's like, I feel like you know, it's strange what the path to equality really looks like. You know, the, the path That's to so equality true. usually yeah. needs things to swing the opposite direction first in before it I think that that's the thing. I think maybe it's just the fact that the scales are so much more heavily in that side of the court, you know, right now than the other. And I think maybe, yeah, if it was a balanced representation, then it wouldn't be so bad because every way you go things get exacerbated by media right you know the portrayal of something or something that's happened is they use a lot of 
you know, emotional words or emotional representation to gauge an audience because that's what it's about. So maybe, yeah, I'd be more up for that. I think yeah. right now I wouldn't mind so much <laughs> if there was not a film or anything or a media mention of anything bad again in the next five or 10 years. But yeah, um, yeah I totally understand what I, you're saying. Uh, yeah, it's a really I, good perspective. To I was going to say that you, I literally spend my days thinking about what is a normal conversation. Um, and my big rule around it, my big rule about normal conversations is like, we don't like, you know, when you said piss before and you're like, oh, I've swore. It's like, first of all, <laughs> if someone comes into my chat and says, I'm so fucking depressed, we don't go language and then let's deal with the depression. You know, it's like, let's deal with the depression first. Um, it's like, <laughs> but it's, um, but it's one of those things, a normalized conversation to me. Um, I mean, I've, you know, like I, I don't use, I don't use trigger or content warnings. I've, I've had a lot of people disagree with me because of this, but my reason being is that I want a truly normalized conversation around mental health and normalized conversations don't have trigger warnings. So that's like, really, again, really interesting perspective because I used to think that exact way um, hmm. a few years ago. And then I'm, I'm now back on using trigger and content warnings um because i understand even though i'm i'm up for a rough and ready real conversation people reading might not be might not be in that place but uh, again yeah. that's that's totally i i can see both sides i yeah. can see where people are at you know no it's it's a really tough one it's like what is the right answer none of us know yeah. it no, like none of us know what the right answer to deal with mental health is um so i have to kind of just sip i mean I, but it's it's funny when people ask me oh why don't you use it or why don't you do this or whatever you know it's um there's, there's a kind of running joke in our household where in fact my wife's literally walking past the door as i'm saying this do you want a coffee uh yes please um so i'm going to talk about the blue sky thinking thing cots um so when when we were on holiday um my wife like just before christmas my wife was like so what do you think the actual future of mental health is going to be and i'm like i don't know and she's like well why don't you just brainstorm it and i was like you think i've not brains <laughs> do you think i'm I, like, I was like i spend all day thinking about this and the answer i've come to after spending all day thinking about this is i don't know it's like and, um, but like the, the funny that's just to me when everyone says let's normalize the conversation around mental health my thing is right well normal it's like you know if, and we, I think about the stigma and how the stigma is contributed to both by those who don't understand mental health, but it can also be contributed to from the inside by us. Mm -hmm. um, for example, yeah, that internal bias, right? Uh, yeah. For example, whenever we talk about suicide, it's now it's now um, basically talked about that we don't use the phrase committed, mm -hmm. right? I won't even put the two words together because I'm not doing it just to be kind of I don't know what's the word I'm looking for here. Um, notorious right now um, but but um i've i was actually in a talk once where someone was telling the story about um their friend that had took their own life and used the phrase committed uh, and someone in the crowd shouted up oh, we don't use that phrase anymore it's um it's not helpful and all the rest of it let me tell you that wasn't helpful either shutting that person down no, that person definitely. was that Re person, reading the room isn't yeah. it yeah that person was like oh okay then well i guess i'm done with my story and I was like, oh, my gosh, that person's now is going to think twice about opening up about their mental health. And someone who was trying to be a little bit woke, um, you know, someone that was trying to kind of keep up to the times with these things. Um, and I understand why we don't use that phrase. It's because suicide isn't a crime. It hasn't been a crime since the late 60s. Um, but but telling someone we don't use this phrase while they're in the middle of telling their story, it's like the greater good was not being worked for there. So, yeah, that's, that's so, like, so interesting. So, cause we get that. And that, I mean, the thing is we work with a truly international audience when we're, when we're on Twitch we've got people from Canada, India, Albania was in earlier. Um, and we've got people from all over the world and it's not, the, the terminology has not been updated in a lot of those places. Mm -hmm. um, in some of those places, it still is a crime. Mm -hmm. So so people are going to use the language that they are familiar with using. And so, yeah, therefore... this is, I guess, again, from my, because I guess my professional experience, I'm not saying necessarily I'm a professional on all mental health, but from the training that I've had, that is totally right. You, know, you never use the word committed and it's not the, the thing to do. However, you're also taught that you need to reflect the language that your client is using or the 100%. person in the room is using with you. And I feel that's more important, you know, to reflect the same language as that person is describing to me. If someone is telling me that they're thinking of committing suicide, I'm going to reflect that back to them with their same language. Yeah. Even though, you know, if I, 
I kind of keep that to myself in terms of, you know, if I'm giving a presentation on it, for example, or something, I won't use that term, you know, yeah. just to, but again, yeah, I totally, totally understand that. And I think, yeah, that's, that's really, really important. I think being more personable, you know, adjusting yourself to the person you're talking to is, is more important, I guess, than, uh, yeah. Yeah. 100 percent um okay cool that leads me on to like this that should have been a short a short segment and it no really i wasn't. really enjoyed that i really enjoyed that <laughs> um i should learn to not gag in on my own podcast um but <laughs> because yeah i talk too much um but um so tell us about what um what your kind of role is through through now like i know obviously you're um you know your work uh, well tell us about your work that you do now and include well, the Instagram know, page and so on the the exciting thing in a way is that I'm I'm literally in between the the roles. So I'm I'm got a couple of weeks now just to put my feet up before I start my new position. So beforehand, um I was a team leader of a vulnerable person service. So um we'd manage basically big things and little things in basically the whole of the community, whether it was, you know, helping somebody to read and write their letters, whether they were, you know, um they weren't able to read or if they were blind or you know if they had lost the use of their hands we found out like a lot of that I guess in sort of the older person's you know age um or if it's you know preventing evictions and um helping people move home or it was my gosh it was like everything um and within that yeah you know we, we faced a lot of I mean mental health I think was paramount in majority of people that we worked with you know especially again, with financial issues and, and things that crop up because of that, you know, I think we worked alongside a lot of the, I guess, the the lower socioeconomic part of the community because yeah. that's where, of course, you know, in poverty, a lot of people are struggling a lot more. So we would do our best, you know, maximise their benefits, maximise their income, help them with debts, help them, you know, clear some stuff and get grants, whatever. Um, so that was, that was great. And I, I did that job for almost seven years um yeah and um I guess I've been in that kind of mental health field I think for maybe 10 11 years now um and I'm moving on to be a psychological well-being practitioner very fancy title <laughs> um but it's it's in the NHS basically so um I'll be based at GP surgeries at doctor surgeries and um, somebody will come and say you know how they're feeling what they're dealing with and um, I will be able to direct them, you know, primary care, secondary care, or I could um, basically sort of take them on with therapy short term uh, under CBT. Amazing. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And on top of that, what about the kind of work that you do through um, what, what the purpose of the Instagram page and the social media accounts? What's the. Um, oh, of course. So, the, yeah, I, I have a, a YouTube channel. You're as an well. influencer. Called, uh, yeah. I we, we, about we, that again, bit. that's another phrase over here that we don't mean we sell skinny tea. We mean we influence the way people think. Um, and we accept that's that. That's a nice way. Of we, we, yeah, that. we accept that and we take the responsibility for it over here as well. Gosh, yeah. Again, I started when I was diagnosed. I started my YouTube channel when I was diagnosed back in 2011. Um, but I felt, you know, the world wasn't quite ready. And I faced a lot of um, backlash, a lot of negative comments. And I ended up deleting my channel. Um, so I started it with a with a good try, basically, to get everyone to understand that I wasn't someone in a Hollywood film you know, with an axe, I wasn't that person. I was just a uni student trying to understand and live with her disorder. Um, and then, yeah, I, I did a documentary with the BBC um, called Diaries of a Broken Mind, which was so great. It was all self-film footage and, you know, you could just kind of send in what you were comfortable with, which I loved. And um, I kind of forgot about it then, I guess. You know, I deleted my channel two years on um, and then basically mind gone in touch my charity got in touch to say you've been nominated for the best documentary of the year and it was like what went along we won and it was like that boost to kind of get me back to doing what I was doing thinking you know what maybe I was doing something right maybe this was for a good reason so yeah I ventured out and the channel name became Multiplicity and Me and that's all it's been about just ending stigma with the ID as our little tagline goes and I just kind of want to make a really authentic account of what my experiences are, but also kind of in, I guess, the last year, maybe again, since I've been 
more confident in my knowledge and more confident in therapy you know it's kind of moved as well to a bit of education so we say we are educated um, when we learn something new <laughs> and that you know I take take that from textbooks I reference everything so people can see themselves where I'm getting the information from too so it's a lived with experience um, from a peer perspective you know yeah. and although I say that I have professional experiences I don't want to be known as a professional on the channel I'm just somebody who's got this who can give you a few peer review journals, you know, and that's me. <laughs> yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. Are you still okay for time? Because I'm aware that we've gone to a full hour. Oh, have we? I'm yeah. I'm cool. I'm cool for time. I'll wrap okay. up whenever you're, okay. you're good to I, wrap. I, I just want to catch up with a few. I catch up with a few questions from of the course. chat. Of course. Um, so one question from chat: How um, how do you cope with it, and does your partner help? Do you sometimes purposefully allow one of them to take the driving seat? For example, if if they if they are younger, does your partner take care of you? Then I think we uh, yeah we probably, you probably covered that already. But are there special helpful things with your partner to help you allow them to come out? So I'll wrap that question up into kind of what role does you know what what's the kind of understanding or level of um, support that you need to get from your partner for all of this. That's interesting, again, because I always say I support him as much as he supports me. And I feel really confident about that. You know, I think, again, men's mental health in particular, I think is really taboo. And, and I think it's it's something that it's so great to see, obviously, like Mindset by Dave, you know, this whole thing where we're not afraid to talk about men's mental health and you you give your experiences. And that helps my husband feel better, you know, and um it's, I mean, we've known it for years and years and years, but he's just now kind of coming to terms with the fact he has ADHD. And, um, you know, he, he does get depressive episodes and he's been through a lot um, in childhood and in uh, recent times. And yeah, you know, I've, I've definitely been there just as much. And I think it's really important in that partnership that, yes, you may, I don't know, say you may have an alter that wants that person's attention and that you know, again, especially I think with a lot of systems that I've met with littles or with child parts, with cis kids, I think is the better term now, with system kids um, who maybe does want uh, that like kind of mothering, I guess, or babying from someone. And I can understand that, but I'd also say equally, it's kind of the responsibility of the system to be mindful of how much that's taking away from your partner or your friend or whoever you're with, I guess. So I totally get that a child part is going to be excited to see their friend or whatever it is. But equally, again, I think it's good to be mindful about how much time they take, you know, like, so yeah, I think not so much for us. Um, maybe, maybe in years before when Ollie was younger, maybe mm -hmm. um but again it was it was something that we were always mindful of um yeah so i'm i'm, I'm hopeful that we uh <laughs> we give as much support back awesome uh, the user with the name not dead just yet says sending lots of love to jess in case you dave read this during the interview um i think they mentioned a couple of things earlier on as well so you've had that's one of the people you've had a lot of love from i think i'm looking at <laughs> I think Bobby Light and Bobbery Milkshake are both oh, here for boo. you. Yeah, Bobby, you as well. Bo, Danielle. <laughs> I think there's a few of us here for you as well, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> Gaming Huskies says Jake pulling out the romance as he does wit -woo. Um <laughs> Let's, like, is, is there any more questions? I wonder if we can... No, I'm not trying... Someone said they wonder if we can trigger one of the altars. I'm not going down that route. That sounds a little bit unethical <laughs> um, <laughs> is memory a big issue with DID oh massively I think that's the, again one of the main points about DID is that you know I describe my brain like Swiss cheese in terms of memory um, and yeah I think again recently it's been better because the, we've had less switching we've had less going on um, but yeah like I said at times I've lost days weeks months um, I think generally I'd say kind of the way I remember things now is that, you know, um, usually I don't remember what I've eaten for breakfast today. I do surprisingly, which is quite new, again, quite new to me. I'm getting used to the fact that, you know, things are a little bit more settled now. Um, but usually I wouldn't remember what I've had for breakfast. Um, I might not know where I've been earlier in the day, but I'm quite comfortable with that now. It's kind of like, I felt like, Back when I first started, I had a lot of blackouts. Like I would just kind of end up in random places and doing random things. And I 
had no idea of how I got there or why or now at least it's kind of like sometimes you end up in a place but you're familiar with how you got there you kind of know why you're there and what you're doing next so it's it's yeah less it's kind of gray out more than blackout I guess is kind of the it's kind of where I would describe it um or I might then again have like an overview of my day but I won't know any detail so I know that we've and I always say gone to see friends or I know that we've um done something else I don't know <laughs> I know that we've gone out to the pub um but I won't know what we drank I won't know who we saw or I won't know just little things like that but I think it, it it comes a stage where you get used to that you know that and you you understand that your memory isn't going to be like other people so this is the best I can hope for I guess and the fact that I, I'm still like over the moon that I can remember what I ate for breakfast I, I yeah that's like such a rarity for me <laughs> so yeah, buzzing. <laughs> um, one final question from the chat, and then I've got one, well, two, two technically to finish off closing questions. One is, um, how do you get to know your alternates? Ooh, um, so time is definitely something. I definitely didn't get to know everyone overnight. Um, my alters are quite unusual, though, in the way that they're very much separate. They have very strong identities, often with DID that isn't the case. So we are more of a minority rather than a majority. We are more the stereotype of what you'd expect. So I always kind of bear that in mind when I talk about it. Um, But yeah, I guess just through time and getting, I guess, listening, understanding like, you know, those feelings of, okay, whose feeling is that? Whose thought is that? Who thinks this? Who thinks that? You understand then where they belong to and what that kind of thought process is, you know? so like, you know, learning, for example, that Ed is a big fish fan, he loves sushi, he loves all that kind of um, the Asian style food. That's his preference, you know, and, and that would be through listening to conversations and like, guess, feeling those preferences because you don't always get a verbal nudge. Sometimes you just feel like you want something or feel that you need to do something and you identify then who that feeling belongs to. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of, yeah, a long time, many years of identifying those sorts of things. I guess I now know, again, preferences, people's likes, dislikes, you know, and things like that. So I can really build a picture. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. You mentioned obviously before about like going out for fr- to see friends and all the rest and, and going out to the pub and stuff. And as you said, both of those two things closely together, I'm like, oh my God, those are things that we can't do at the minute. Oh, no. um, did did your alters did your alters all share opinions about about how we should how we should live our lives during COVID or was there a bit of an internal dialogue going on there? Oh, that's interesting. No, I think we're all very much um, in team stay at home and save lives. <laughs> and, you know, I think as well going over to the NHS. I think I would be very. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was. It's... Yeah, if I if I didn't also agree with that. Um, no, I think yeah, there are because there are of course things that we agree on as well, and I think again, that's a big push in terms of stereotype is that everyone needs to be vastly different and have all these vastly different thoughts but again that's not always the case so at least not to my knowledge I think everyone's been quite happy with the uh the don't go out I know Ed very much misses shopping which was his like big thing so um you know now he gets to suit and boot up gloves on mask on and go into the shops at two meters apart if absolutely when and necessary <laughs> but that's that's the closest he's getting now is looking at um you know the clothes in Asda and Morrison's when you can go into those kind of supermarkets that's about it <laughs> yeah and then absolute final question where would you like people to go to find out a bit more about you and what you do oh well well Dave I'm so glad you asked um <laughs> going over to our YouTube channel would be great. So that's Multiplicity and Me. We love if you subscribed over there. Usually we do release videos on the 1st and the 15th of each month. Last month was a, a, just a hectic month, so haven't had a chance. But I'm hoping we'll have another video ready soon. Um, you know, like I said, we try and keep to those dates, but equally we don't pressure ourselves, you know, because again, mental health is mental health and that does take priority. Um, and like I said, we do it for a hobby. It's just something that we do for fun um so yes come on over to our youtube we also have an instagram facebook twitter and a patreon so whichever platform you're on we would absolutely love to see you there and um i've I've got to do it as well my husband bless him he's got a twitch that he's just started um so that's called nightmaric with a k K k-n-i-g-h-t-m-a-r-i-c 
and I'm sure he'll be very grateful to see you as well. <laughs> All right, awesome. Let's um, let's spam his channel with a load of likes. Um, Raven's just put up the link to your YouTube channel in the chat as well, and we'll um, thank you. And we'll do that. Um, it's been, pff, I mean, I've been looking forward to this like since you agreed, and yeah, this has just been it's been amazing for me because I, I other than obviously the terrible stereotypical variation of it i know a thing or two i've read because I've, I've read um as i said it's always fascinated me in the fact that one of the articles i read a long time ago and I say by a long time i mean four years um <laughs> was about someone who's one of their alters had diabetes Mm-hmm. Um, and was as in medically had diabetes. So, you know, you said before about the muscle memory in for the eyesight and things like that, or the muscle memory for being left-handed, for example. Well, their entire endocrine system was like, uh, had had its own thing. And um, I just thought that was, I just, I just think it's just, if, if, if DID doesn't prove the ability of the brain's abil- the ba- the brain's ability to to overcome overcome certain aspects in the body or literally change things within our physiological responses and stuff, then I don't know what does. Um, because like DID's got has got has given kind of complete us a proof that someone's brain um can actually trigger diabetes um or can trigger left handedness or can. You know, there's there are there's there's people that have there have been kind of studies as well that have said that people speak different languages. Some of their alters speak different languages. Languages that the 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 you know the main alter has no business knowing. <laughs> um, so it's just absolutely fascinating to me. Um, I always sign off by saying, if you master the mind, you can master anything. And then you usually finish that off with, and sometimes mastering the mind means. In this instance, if you are someone with diagnosed or undiagnosed DID, sometimes mastering the mind might mean going and actually doing a bit, a lot of work on this, doing that psychoeducation that you were talking about earlier. Um, and, you know, looking at where the dissociation and the integration can be um, under the care of a team, as ideally. Um, but by learning about the situation yourself a lot more and educating yourself. Um, thank you once again, Jess, for joining me. It has been an absolute pleasure. And, oh, um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, Dave. I just, yeah, I feel like I feel like we've known each other like forever, but it was only like two weeks ago, something like that. Two weeks, right? two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're very easy to get to know. So, um, oh, thank you. And you've been, yeah, and you've then, been extremely probably, accommodating. <laughs> thank you. Well, hopefully, we we can get together again soon. You know, I, I kind of feel that we'll we we could have some good projects in the future. So. 100%. Watch this space. (laughs) 100%. Especially if you have ideas, because I was joking around before saying, um, someone donated a bunch of subs to my channel earlier today and as it stands i don't really need money for stuff right now so i said the thing i said and a couple of my friends do um, so i'm going to try and pay it forward to, to some people but um but i said the only thing stopping me these days is the balance between time and ideas i either mm-hmm. have all the ideas and no time or all the time and no ideas i relate so, i relate um, so that would be some collaborations would be absolutely amazing everyone in chat i'm going to disappear off to the loo for a minute and um, yeah again if you master the mind you can master anything catch you all soon thank you, thank you mindset by day thanks everyone bye, bye.